We begin with breaking news here at 6, de the death of a Floorsville City Councilman. We can confirm that Councilman Gerard Jimenez was killed in a two-car crash today. It happened along State Highway 97 just west of Floorsville. The cause of the crash is still unknown right now and no other details have been released so far. We'll bring you the latest information as soon as we receive it. Now to scary moments at the SAPD Southwest Police Substation. The entire building evacuated after a strong odor believed to be a gas leak filled the air. Devin Clark was there as investigators worked to determine what caused that stench and tells us how this whole process played out. Just like sewage, very strong sewage smell. Others outside of the Southwest Police Substation this afternoon likened the stench to rotten eggs, burning hair, and lit matches. The odor so strong and overpowering, it caused employees to evacuate the building while the San Antonio Fire Department, Hazmat, and CPS Energy crews went in to investigate. So we came and we checked uh, to see if there was a gas leak, and we did not find a gas leak. Fortunately, fears were quelled after numerous tests determined there wasn't any danger in the air just funk. We uh, assisted them in ventilating the building. Detectives off camera said that the ordeal caused them to pause working on important investigations. But everyone knows that today's investigation into the foul, potentially dangerous odor was a necessary one. Well, it's pretty important that we come out and make sure that there's no carbon monoxide or any other gases that could be harmful to anybody's uh, health. Officials here at the Southwest Area substation say that it took about 50 minutes to get the all clear and allow the employees to go back inside. They did leave the doors open to make sure that the smell aired out. Still no word on what caused it. Reporting on the South Side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. While no cause has been confirmed, officials there at the scene said that the smell may have been caused by the sewage system or a burned out air conditioner belt for a unit on the roof. Crews will continue trying to pinpoint that cause. Meantime, they remind everyone that if you suspect a gas leak, call 911 immediately. A new at six from jilted lover to one of four suspects arrested in a shooting, which left two teenagers injured on the city's southeast side this weekend. 22 year old Lamar Eugene Anthony Sterling is accused of, of shooting his 16 year old ex girlfriend and her new 17 year old boyfriend with a rifle. It happened in the 4900 block of Pecan Grove on yes, excuse me, yesterday. Police say the teen couple sitting in a car when they were approached by Sterling and three other people. Sterling reportedly wearing a hoodie and bandana and holding a rifle. Police say Sterling then fired multiple rounds. The new boyfriend returned fire with two firearms he had in his car. Both teens in the car suffered serious injuries, were hospitalized. They're expected to live. Sterling charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The other suspects involved haven't been identified yet. Swell cycle no longer. San Antonio Bike Share is trying to figure out a way forward now after 400,000 in annual sponsorship dollars was pulled a year early in a three year contract. Even facing funding challenges and new competition, the executive director tells our Garrett Berger she thinks there is still a future for bike sharing. When the dollars go, so does the branding. The title sponsorship for San Antonio Bike Share with Southwest General Hospital, which is under Steward Healthcare, is over as of the start of this year. So they notified us last year in 2019 that they were opting out early out of the contract. On top of that, SE Bike Share's yeah, yeah. executive director, J.D. Simpson, yeah, said they're still waiting to receive 200000 from last year, though half of it is supposedly on its way. Simpson doesn't think they're in any imminent danger. We're just trying to figure out how to get us through this hump. But it needs long-term solutions. The nonprofit wants to increase ridership and sponsorships. And while it doesn't currently get any money for operations from the city of San Antonio, it's exploring that possibility too. We just need to find some solid uh, consistent solutions, not um, these one offs. But there's also new competition from e scooters to consider. The bikes and the scooters work a little bit differently. There's no throttle on these bikes, but some of them do have a battery powered pedal assist. And of course, the scooters aren't restricted in their parking. Simpson said bike share rides took a dip around the time the scooters hit in summer 2018, though they have been bouncing back, and she's not taking an adversarial stance. One solution does not solve everyone's problems every day. The bikes look cooler and probably safer than the scooters because those are hard to do. Yeah, They're really, yeah they, uh, I've tried it before, they slip. And with the scooter market stabilizing with new exclusive city contracts, it may be easier to collaborate. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The cleanup continues less than two months after the Market Platz building at the Worst Fest grounds in New Braunfels destroyed by fire. 
Cleanup crews were on site this morning, shoveling and removing what was left behind. The building went up in flames on November 15th, a few days after the 59th annual Worst Fest. The cause still under investigation, but with nearly a full year to rebuild, people are hopeful the space will be back up and running in time for next year's celebration, which begins November 6th. If you walked along the Riverwalk today, you might have noticed it wasn't quite as picturesque as usual. That was on purpose. Every year around this time, the city drains parts of the river for maintenance. Sarah Acosta explains how local biologists are taking advantage of that drain to help out the local ecosystem. Yeah, this is a small one. Oh, really? We found one earlier about the size of a quarter, too. That's an apple snail, and they aren't from around here. In fact, they are hurting the local ecosystem around the San Antonio Riverwalk. They are voracious eaters, so they eat um, any sort of native aquatic plants that we might have in these stretches. Um, and then they're just out competing native snails. But they aren't the reason behind the city's river drain. The city drains the river for infrastructure repairs so they can get equipment like this truck into the river to make those repairs. A repair needed to be done on gate number six, so part of the river from Josephine Street to Nueva Street was drained today and will be refilled on Thursday. During the drain, biologists with the San Antonio River Authority say their job is to move native species to safer water and clean up those invasive species, which originally are from South America, or in this case, your local pet store. You can readily find these at a PetSmart or Petco, so somebody almost definitely bought it for their aquarium, got too big, and so they dumped it into the river. The pesky snails were discovered in October, and several pink egg sacs were collected then. As biologist Chris Vaughn explains, it's vital to relocate the snails to keep local fish and plants alive and thriving. So the aquatic plants are vital to the food web, they create uh, nursery habitat for fish. They're just super important for the, the total assemblage. That was Sarah Costa reporting. A health alert this evening. Cedar fever has certainly returned to San Antonio. Unlike the flu, doctors say cedar fever actually does not produce fever in its sufferers. Typical symptoms include runny nose, sneezing, congestion, along with irritated, itchy eyes. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. The nasal symptoms that accompany our reaction to high levels of pollen in the air from the ash juniper tree, also known as mountain cedar. Unless you want to leave the San Antonio area from January through February or March, it's really going to be hard to avoid mountain cedar. Doctors say we doctors we spoke with say over the counter antihistamines can ease some of the symptoms. A lot of people saying bless you in the newsroom today. <laughs> Just the video of the trees yeah, that seem to have the clouds of mountain cedar over them. No. Yeah, not a good sight. This one not too great either. 281 at the quarry here. The southbound lanes definitely slow going at this hour. We don't know any reasons why, but this is a typical slow down spot for the six o'clock commute. And I guess it's appropriate as we take a look at live cam 71 degrees out there and other places they're talking about snowstorms here. We're talking about pollen flurries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an annual event around here and well comes multiple times a year, especially as we get into the spring again with uh, our oak pollen. But this time of year, it's all about the mountain cedar comfortable temperatures. But there's that cedar count, which is very high at 28,000. Mold is also moderate. I want to point that out with a count of 570. So the wind is actually starting to shift out of the northwest. I don't think that's going to do us any favors for that cedar count. We'll talk more about that and, of course, what this weak cold front means for us coming up in a few minutes, Steve. Thank you, Adam. As tensions escalate in the Middle East, President Trump putting Congress on notice that if Iran retaliates in the wake of the U.S. killing of military commander Qassem Soleimani, the U.S. will quickly strike again. Iran entered another day of mourning today with thousands attending Soleimani's funeral. Washington now bracing for Iran's next move after Soleimani's replacement vowed revenge. Meanwhile, in Iraq, members of its parliament at the request of the prime minister took a symbolic vote to expel all American troops. President Trump then warned Iraq if it follows through on removing U.S. troops, quote, we will charge them sanctions like they've never seen before ever, end quote. NATO's secretary general now calling for restraint and de-escalation. A new conflict would be in no one's interest. 
so Iran must refrain from further violence and provocations. Back here at home, the House expected to vote on a war powers resolution to limit the president's military actions. On Wednesday, an all-Senate meeting on the Soleimani strike and the rising tensions with Iran is expected. In the race for 2020 now, former presidential candidate and former San Antonio Mayor Julian Castro is now endorsing Elizabeth Warren for the Democratic nomination. Castro made the announcement in a video on Twitter today. He dropped out of the race for president last week. Castro says Warren is the one candidate who's unafraid to fight to make sure America's promise will be there for everyone. Castro is expected to appear with Warren at a Brooklyn campaign event tomorrow night. Here at home all month long, the San Antonio Public Library honoring the women in the Holocaust. And they started things off earlier today. This year marks the eighth Holocaust Learn and Remember event. This year's theme focused on women. Attendees get the chance to explore the Holocaust through the eyes of survivors, through powerful art exhibits, live performances, and presentations. We have exhibits, lectures, films that talks about the Holocaust, and we teach through that experience, remembering the Holocaust, about the importance of tolerance, the importance of accepting our differences, our diversity, celebrating our diversity, uh, to reject hate. The month-long commemoration happening at the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. It's off Northwest Military Highway. Coming up at 6, Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein facing new allegations the same day his rape trial began in New York. We head to the courtroom coming up. But first, he was breaking every bone in his body, and doctors had no idea what was wrong with him. We'll tell you about a disease which left this patient almost unable to walk at one point. Next. Physical therapy to help with his degenerative disc, steroid injections to treat his psoriatic arthritis. One young high school teacher went from doctor to doctor and diagnosis to diagnosis to find out why his bones were breaking, but left with more pain than answers. Two years ago, David Covington didn't think his back pain and general weakness would turn into him needing a cane at just 27. He even had a hard time with household chores. And I couldn't get the lawnmower started, so it was just a pull, and I wasn't strong enough to, to pull it on. Doctors did a full body scan on David and found he had several stress fractures throughout his body. That was kind of where it really felt like, oh, like maybe this is something more serious than just back pain. After two orthopedists, a rheumatologist, and months of treatments, David's condition worsened, and he became so weak that he was falling. Then an endocrinologist at Vanderbilt University said a tumor in his brain may be the culprit. A rare problem called TIO, which stands for tumor-induced osteomalacia, so tumors causing breakdown of bone. David was referred to neurosurgeon Reed Thompson, who at first thought it was a benign tumor. If you ask most neurosurgeons who specialize in brain tumors what it is that you have, they would say it's a benign tumor, nothing to worry about. But a quick search about TIO changed his mind. We really had to do that operation because it was it was a chance to actually cure him of this disease which was ravishing his body. After the surgery and about a month of physical therapy, David felt back to normal. It would take about five minutes to get to my car from my front door. Now it takes about 15 seconds. And two months after surgery, David was back in his classroom teaching pain-free. Doctors say that David's case of TIO was even more rare because of its location. Most of those tumors are normally found in the hands, feet, or nasal cavities. All right, there's no doubt we need rain. Mm -hmm. Just because we need rain. Yes. But also because it helps with the whole pollen situation in mountain feet, mountain cedar. Now, yeah, it, it, it's nice when those raindrops pick up some of those pollen grains and wash them, Get them on wash them here. away. And yet if you go outside, especially if you park outdoors, you see that little dusty film on your windshield. Oh, that's the cedar pollen. Yep. So it is visible to the naked eye, especially uh, those of you that have cedar trees or live in the hill country, you just tap it or hit it with a bat and poof, or you just get a breeze and then you get that cloud of pollen. So let's start talking about this and then we'll get into the forecast. So mountain cedar very high today, count of over 28,000. We talked about that earlier. We are basically right in peak season as a typical season would go for mountain cedar. Peaks in mid-January 
and it all comes to an end, usually around Valentine's Day. So there we are right in the middle of that big average peak season for mountain cedar today. And we do have a cold front that's moving in and that's going to give us a wind shift. And that's important when it comes to mountain cedar because a good portion of it comes from the hill country. And when we get a wind coming out of the hill country, well, it usually reinforces or even increases that mountain cedar count. So notice how the wind is starting to shift. Rock Springs out of the northwest, Fredericksburg out of the north. This is all part of a very weak cold front that I just drew very faintly right here northwest of San Antonio. This will continue to push southeastward as it does. It's going to bring the wind out of the hill country. That's the key here when it relates to mountain cedar. Normally it wouldn't be a big deal. We would just say, oh, we have some drier air moving in, but it's drier air with the likelihood of uh, just reinforcing that cedar count. So here's our future cast just for the winds. 7 p.m. starting to turn northwesterly in northwestern Bear County. Then we go through the night by midnight. We all have that north northwesterly breeze and as it's coming from the hill country, it's likely to just reinforce that high or very high mountain cedar count and that's going to last all the way through the morning. All right, so temperatures. We made it up to 74 today after a morning low of 41. Fairly typical morning, but this afternoon was 12 degrees above average and 10 degrees shy of our record high of 84. And right now, look at the difference here. Pleasanton just dropped off to 57. Hondo 65. 64 Rock Springs, 64 in Kerrville, and 72 in Catula. So some wide ranging numbers out there, depending on where you are. You get farther north in this state, and yeah, up in the panhandle, we're in the 40s, but clearly this is not one of those big heavy hitting cold fronts. It's hard to even detect it unless you look at just the wind shift and a little drop in dew points and atmospheric moisture, but it's there and it's going to move through. It's just not going to have a huge impact on our temperatures. We'll probably shave off eight degrees tomorrow afternoon compared to what we have today. So take a look at our satellite and radar and just some high thin clouds streaming in from the southwest. So not only will this front not have a big impact on our temperatures, but unfortunately, it's not going to give us any needed rainfall to get rid of the cedar, boost the aquifer, or put a dent in the drought. Dry, uneventful frontal passage here with this. So early tomorrow morning at sunrise, we're thinking a few degrees above freezing throughout most of the hill country, but you get up to junction in about 26. At Fredericksburg 34, Kerrville 33. Here in San Antonio, about 41 for the morning low temperature and then widespread 60s by tomorrow afternoon. So we'll go from the 70s to the 60s. That's the kind of effect this cold front's going to have. We do it all over again on Wednesday, just a little more of a chill in the air Wednesday morning. By Thursday, the humidity is actually going to return. You'll notice a hit, some mugginess in the air Thursday and Friday. It's probably going to give us some morning fog and maybe a few sprinkles and then lead to the chance for some thunderstorms late Friday evening as another cold front approaches us. So that's the next feature we're going to be watching and keeping an eye on. Something we need. In more ways than one. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go live to the AT&T Center right now. Greg Simmons joins us with what is clearly a Bucks back to back greg what's interesting i was asked if five what did the spurs do wrong to have to face the best team in the nba in back to back games patty mills said today well at least we get them out of the way well when we come back will lonnie walker get another start after his first ever career start in milwaukee and the cowboys have their new head coach coming up Good evening, everybody. Welcome live to Courtside here at the AT&T Center, where tonight our San Antonio Spurs are tasked with the, the effort here to try and beat the best team in the NBA for the second game in a row, the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, that's after they lost to the Bucks in Milwaukee on Saturday night, 127-118 behind Giannis Antetokounmpo, who's averaging almost 31 points and 12 and a half rebounds a game that puts Milwaukee at 23-0 for the season against teams that are less than 500. Jante Murray expected back tonight after missing Saturday's game due to personal reasons. That means both Derek White and Lonnie Walker expected back on the bench after Walker got his first start in his NBA career this past weekend. I thought he did well. I mean, just this way it does, you know, um, pushes the tempo, um, was aggressive, and um, I mean, we all had mistakes, so uh, just learn from it and grow from it. Another thing into the bank for for us and, and how we're trying to grow, it's it's great experience for, for him. I'm sure um, he learned a lot from it. Um, and now, you know, just talking to him in, in free throws, it's about using that and, and understanding how he can use that as the season goes on and then how he can grow. All right, here is a matchup tonight. Tip time 7.30. Highlights for you tonight on the night beat. Pro football coverage 
Powered by Davis Law Firm. Jason Garrett is out. Mike McCarthy is in as a new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, the former Packers coach, confirming today he had signed with the Cowboys after two days of interviews in Dallas, including staying at the home of Jerry Jones. It is reported a five-year deal. McCarthy has said the playoff resume Jerry Jones is looking for that includes making the postseason nine of his 13 seasons in Green Bay, leading the Packers to a Super Bowl win in 2011 at Jerry World over the Pittsburgh Steelers and ending the Cowboys season twice in the postseason in 2014 and 2016. Cowboys owner issued a statement on Sunday that the team would not seek a contract extension for Jason Garrett, ending his 10-year run as head coach of the Cowboys. Jones releasing the statement during the Eagles playoff game, the same team that ended the Cowboys playoff chances and then got beat by Seattle 17-9 to knock them out of the playoffs. In that game, Carson Wentz was knocked out by former Texan Jadavian Clowney on just the second series, did not return with a head injury. At the same time, the Vikings ended the New Orleans Saints playoff run on a controversial finish in overtime, tied at 20 all in the Vikings. Kirk Cousins able to find tight end Kyle Rudolph in the corner of the end zone for the game-winning touchdown, but not without claims of pass interference. The replay shows Rudolph pushing off on P.J. Williams, but officials let it stand. Shades of the no call on the Rams last year in the NFC Championship game. Here is a matchup for the NFC Divisional Playoffs. Minnesota taking on San Francisco Saturday at 335. Seattle and Green Bay lock horns Sunday at 540. There will be a new Super Bowl champ this year after the New England Patriots were knocked out of the playoffs by the Tennessee Titans 20 to 13 and with his contract expiring we may have seen the last game Tom Brady as a member of the Patriots doesn't sound like the six-time Super Bowl champ is thinking about retiring at 42. Is there any possibility that you would retire after the, this last season? Uh, I you know I would say it's pretty unlikely but yeah hopefully unlikely. Okay, not making a strong statement there. Here's a matchup for the AFC as a result. Tennessee taking on Baltimore Saturday at 7.15 in a night game. Houston travels to Kansas City for a 2.05 kickoff on Sunday, and KSAT 12 Sports will be there. More on the Spurs in just a few minutes. Live from the AT&T Center, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Yeah, more on the special efforts that Patty Mills are ma is making. Exactly. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. We begin with some breaking news we're following here on the north side. This is a look from Sky 12 of a wreck here at 410 and Blanco. It appears to be a rollover crash involving one vehicle. Yeah, you can see the traffic is, you know, one lane basically, and they're kind of making their own lane as they weave around this accident. Looks like it may be an SUV on its side. Again, this is 410 and Blanco area. To give you an idea, if you're in that area or somebody's traveling home from that area, that's why they're late, because this is really causing a backup. And you can see people also just slowing down to get a look at what's happening, even though mm -hmm. the accident's not happening necessarily where they're traveling. Meantime, some big developments today regarding disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein as his trial for five sex crimes begins in New York City. He's now facing new charges of rape and other sex crimes in Los Angeles. A Weinstein already facing the possibility of life in prison if convicted today in court. His defense attorneys and the prosecution began sparring almost immediately. ABC's Trevor Alt with a story from New York. Today, just hours after his rape trial began in New York City, now infamous Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein hit with new serious allegations in Los Angeles. The district attorney there announcing separate charges of rape and other sex crimes. We believe the evidence will show that the defendant used his power and influence to gain access to his victims and then committed violent crimes against them. Weinstein was already charged with five sex crimes in New York City, that long-awaited trial beginning this morning with a procedural hearing. Both sides accusing each other of abominable behavior. At some point, the jurors are just going to start to blame the defense and look like they're victim bashing, which is exact, exactly what they're doing. Weinstein's lead defense attorney responding, saying she's done nothing but defend her client. Mr. Weinstein, again, has a right to a fair trial. I think she believes he's convicted already. That's not how this works. Weinstein has pled not guilty and said any sexual relations were consensual. Today, the prosecution also made several references to seven photographs they'd be introducing as evidence, not revealing what those show, but saying they'd be handled sensitively so as not to embarrass Weinstein. All the while, outside, several of Weinstein's accusers had gathered, wearing red, they say, to take their power back. That we've come to this moment of justice is staggering. The trial means so much to so many. 
In total, more than 80 women have accused Harvey Weinstein of some form of sexual misconduct. Today, Los Angeles investigators said they hope these new charges they have filed against him will inspire even more potential victims to come forward. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. Around America, a group of sailors happy to be home after they were stranded at sea for more than a week in the Pacific Ocean. The crew was planning to sail from Japan to Hawaii when they hit rough waters. They were later overturned by a large wave. They managed to get the boat upright again, but the boat was damaged and had lost all its communications. Days later, the Coast Guard came to their rescue, and that's what you're seeing caught on camera right here. Headlines around the world now. 20 firefighters from California are headed to Australia today to help battle those devastating wildfires there. Australian officials, meanwhile, say they're committing an additional $1.4 billion toward recovery efforts. That's in addition to the tens of millions of dollars already promised. The funds will reportedly go to rebuilding towns destroyed by those fires. So far, at least 25 people have been killed and some 2,000 homes destroyed by the flames. Today, it's Australia's largest naval vessel sailed to the south coast of New South Wales, where the fires have done some of the most damage. As far as this vessel is concerned, they have been brought here to conduct any evacuations and provide any assistance necessary. This Seahawk behind me, it has been conducting reconnaissance missions throughout the day, traveling up and down the coastline, looking for any communities that have been cut off from the bushfires. Rain and cooler temperatures today brought some relief, but more than 135 fires are still burning including 70 that have not been contained. And Australian officials warn their wildfire season, which usually lasts until March, is nowhere near its end. What Spurs guard Patty Mills has to say about the situation in his home, Australia, coming up in just a few minutes with Greg Simmons. But meanwhile, in Indonesia now, the death toll has risen to 66 in the flash floods and landslides in the greater Jakarta region. That's according to the country's National Disaster Mitigation Agency. The agency's spokesperson also confirmed more than 35,000 people have been displaced in the area. They're currently taking refuge in government office buildings, schools, malls, which have been turned into evacuation centers. Doctors have been made available at all the temporary housing facilities to tend to the injured and sick. In Mexico yesterday, firefighters fought to save the lives of a family that had fallen off the road and down into a gully. Firefighters used ropes and rescue equipment to save the five people trapped more than 65 feet below where they fell. All five people were rescued nearly four hours into this operation. Among them was a two-year-old girl. It's unclear exactly how this family fell. Another hurdle for Boeing this week. The company has acknowledged there's another potential issue with its 737 MAX. The New York Times reporting Boeing and regulators say there are concerns about the wiring on that plane. Spokesman Gordon John Rowe says the company's highest priority is ensuring the 737 MAX meets all safety and regulatory requirements. He adds Boeing is working with the FAA and others to make sure the design is safe and compliant. The MAX grounded early last year after two fatal crashes were caused by issues with a different system. It's still to come. The title of greatest ever will soon belong to one of three of Jeopardy's most winning contestants. Plus, why Lizzo says that she is taking a break from Twitter. Those stories up next in The Buzz. Hey, Alexa, pay for gas. That's what you could soon be saying to pay for a tank of gas with Amazon's virtual assistant, Exxon, Exxon Mobil and Amazon announcing a partnership today at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. It will let drivers use voice commands to buy fuel for their cars that have Alexa built in. Smartphones and other devices will also work. The new platform is set to launch in April at more than 11,000 Exxon and Mobil gas stations across the country. In the buzz today, music artist Lizzo took to Twitter yesterday to announce... She is quitting Twitter. The singer says that she can't handle the trolls on the social media platform anymore, but she says she'll be back when she feels like it. Yep, the decision comes days after the Truth Hurts singer clapped back at someone who said her success was due to the obesity epidemic. Lizzo has dealt with negativity before. She told Billboard magazine in 2019 that, quote, I've always had to turn haters 
into congratulators. I like End that. quote. I do too. <laughs> Get ready for the biggest battle in game show history. Jeopardy's top three winners will soon face off for the title, the greatest of all time. Alums Ken Jennings, Brad Rutter, and James Holzhauer will compete in a series of matches with host Alex Trebek starting this week and lasting through January 16th. Yeah, the one who wins three of the matches will get a $1 million prize. The two other contestants will each get $250,000. Not bad. Yeah, Trebek says he may not be hosting the show much longer because of his battle with pancreatic cancer. He says he will stay on for as long as he can and support from fans has made the battle easier to endure. Today is a sweet one indeed. It is National Shortbread Day in honor of the traditional Scottish treat enjoyed across the world. It's typically made with white sugar, butter and flour, but there's many modern variations which can include salt, ground rice, corn flour and frosting. It's called shortbread because of its shorter or crumbly texture. You can mark the day by trying out a new shortbread recipe, enjoying it over tea with a friend, or maybe bring them to work to share with your coworkers. Or you can just go buy some. <laughs> National Shortbread Day, the same day that uh, Girl Scout cookie orders were going around the news. That is one of my favorite. I don't think they call them shortbread anymore. Mm -hmm. Are they, what are the, they called? I don't know what they're called. I should know this. But it's one of my favorite Girl Scout cookies. The blue box, I think. Yeah. There you go. Tagalongs? Is that it? No, those, no, are, those are the peanut buttery butter ones. Maybe they still call them. They're all them good. Short, that, that's the problem. They're all good. I beg to differ. <laughs> okay, I'm not a Thin Mint fan. Really. Okay, I'm one I of the only I'm people. I'm not either. You're not. But I don't like mint and chocolate. Yes. But everyone else appears to love them. Agree. Yeah, I disagree with you guys. I like, <laughs> I like the Thin Mints. Well, today we started the day at 41, made it to 74 by the afternoon, and we had a bit of warmth out there. I mean, we were 10 degrees above average for this time of year, and Laredo topped out at 80 degrees. That was the hot spot across the state, along with Del Rio at 81. But notice those cooler temperatures to the north? They're headed our way. We'll talk more about that with the cold front coming up. I think the tagalongs are the peanut butter and chocolate. That's right. Ooh, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Spurs guard Patty Mills has long been a champion of his native Australia, but now his country is in crisis. As we talked about just a few minutes ago, wildfires have now scorched an area twice the size of the state of Maryland. At least 25 people losing their lives, destroying as many as 2,000 homes there. And then Mills revealing today that as many as 480 million animals have been affected by these fires. And today for the first time, Patty spoke with us about his homeland that is burning. With more, let's take you back to the AT&T Center. It's where we find our Greg Simmons. Greg, he wears his love for Australia on his, on his sleeve. And he feels like his obligation to let people know what's going on and make them aware. Patty Mills is from Canberra, Australia, which is one of the hardest hit areas of the wildfires where residents have been told to stay indoors. Patty telling us today he still has family and friends living there. Now, Mills is the longest tenure spur with the retirement of the Big Three as one of only two left in the Spurs from their last championship in 2014. Today, following shoot around before tonight's game against Milwaukee, Patty admitted to us it's been tough on him. Watch what is happening to his home country. It's very devastating what's what's happening. Um, I've been keeping a, a close eye on on it all. Um, as tough as it can be from, from over here um, and in contact with, with a number of people. Um, yeah, it, it's one of those um, disasters and, and a, a national crisis that is hard to comprehend and um, being over here in in America in Texas, it's um, it's a, there's a a little bit of a helpless feeling, um, but trying to do all I can to, to play my part and and, and help um, you know a, a country that is that is struggling right now. Now, Patty added that people don't really understand just how big this is. It's not stopping. It will continue to get worse as temperatures rise in Australia and it continues to get drier. That means this coming week, there's a very good chance that wildfires could actually grow and new fires actually ignite. Our thoughts are with Patty tonight, his family, friends, the people, and the animals of Australia. Live from the AT&T Center, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Very well said. Thank you, Greg. And some, right. some of the images just coming out of yeah. Australia are so hard to believe. Yeah, even satellite imagery that just shows the smoke in the air going way out into the Pacific. I mean, it's it's fascinating. It really yeah. is. And the news that it's going to get worse. That's not Patty good. Mills, also yeah. not good. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're dealing with 
mountain cedar doesn't seem quite that bad when you look at what's happening in <laughs> exactly. Australia. It's like, I'll take some snippets. Yeah, everything's relative, right? And, you know, you go outside, you can see the cedar. If you have, um, you know, one of those electric blowers or gas blowers and you blow off your patio furniture, you'll see, poof, that little plume. And that's generally mountain cedar right now. Of course, some dust mixed in, but mostly mountain cedar, and that's what we have in our air. And uh, the wind that's going to shift is really not going to help us out. I mean, we're 71 degrees right now with uh, wind out of the south at five. That's actually a good direction when it comes to mountain cedar, but in peak season, it's hard to really put a big dent in that number. But the wind is going to shift around even more and becoming northerly at 10 to 20 miles per hour, and that's likely to just reinforce that cedar count because the bulk of the cedar trees and the heights con concentration is up in the hill country. So we all know this time of year when you get that north wind, usually it elevates or just somewhat reinforces that cedar count. And this is a result of a weak cold front that's moving in. Temperatures, as you saw, not being affected all that much by midnight, will be down to 59 degrees. But there's a look at that weak front. Kerrville already northerly now, so the front has just moved through your neck of the woods. Del Rio, Rock Springs, Fredericksburg, you're behind the front, but you may not even notice it other than a little increase in the wind outside. I mean, look at these temperatures. 71 in San Antonio, but Kerrville 66. Del Rio 73, Rock Springs at 64. Not a hard hitting cold front here at all by any means. And temperatures just gradually drop off as you get up into the panhandle and parts of the plain states. That's it. There's the wind shift, not a big temperature drop. Then we will see a, some cooler readings the next couple of days. It's not going to be a big, strong cold front that really, you know, puts a big change in our temperatures. Not, it's not, not that kind of boundary. And it's dry too, unfortunately. We could use rain in more ways than one. Obviously, we could use the rain for the aquifer and for uh, our drought-stricken areas and also to wash the pollen out of the air, but there's nothing, hardly any clouds even, associated with this cold front. Just some high clouds way up above us streaming in from the southwest. Those aren't going to give us any rain. So unfortunately, a dry cold front and one that's just going to likely reinforce the the uh, very high mountain cedar count. So here's what we're expecting early tomorrow morning. Beeville 46, Gonzales at sunrise 41, Kerrville 33, Fredericksburg 34. Notice getting close to freezing in parts of the hill country, even Uvalde 36 to start the day. Locally from Randolph 41 to Lackland as well, Castroville about 41 degrees, but you get up to Bernie closer to 37 in Timberwood Park 39. So a bit of a chill in the air tomorrow morning, but sunny, and in the 60s, so overall, actually a very seasonable day uh, when it's all said and done. Bright sunshine and mid 60s across most of South Texas. 41 in the morning. Here's your planner for tomorrow. A cool start to the day in San Antonio. A wind that's going to be shifting around a bit. So I'm just going to call it variable at 5 to 10 miles per hour. 58 at noon, 66 the high temperature. We do it all over again on Wednesday. Sunny and in the 60s, but it will be a little bit cooler to start that day. And you'll actually notice some humidity back in the air by Thursday and Friday, some mugginess. We haven't had much of that over the past couple of months. That should lead to some morning fog, maybe a few sprinkles of so Thursday and Friday, and then also potentially lead to some late evening thunderstorms late on Friday as, a, as our next cold front moves into town. All right, let's hope it pans out into some real rain. Yeah, that'd be nice. We could use somebody that. somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's I See Why Am I. It is Monday. It is January 6th. These numbers here mean misery for a lot of us. Instead, Mountain Cedar is to blame. It's making a lot of people miserable these days. Here's a look at why. A KSAT viewer shared this video with us from Canyon Lake. You can see just how much pollen is rising off those trees and filling the air. Pollen from the ash juniper, or as we call it, Mountain Cedar, has people all over town reaching for the tissues. Unless you want to leave the San Antonio area from January through February or March, it's really going to be hard to avoid. Senseless violence, that's how neighbors describe a shooting on the city's southeast side yesterday. And police say a 16-year-old girl and a 17-year-old boy were sitting in a car when four men walked up and started shooting. At least 12 shots were fired from two weapons. One of them was left at the scene. The teens were taken to University Hospital and are expected to be okay. Police say those suspects are still on the run. Yeah, the Dallas Cowboys have a new head coach. He is Mike McCarthy, the former head coach of the Green Bay Packers. 
Packers. That's according to several published reports today. Yesterday, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones made it official, announcing that Jason Garrett would not be back next year to coach the Cowboys. There were reports over the weekend that Jerry and Stephen Jones were interviewing Marvin Lewis and McCarthy and have settled on the proven winner. Big night for a Lakers fan over in L.A. Check it out. 40-year-old Dean Tran was selected to shoot a half-court shot for a $100,000 prize during the Lakers-Pistons game, and he nailed it. When asked what he plans to do with the money, Tran said he might get a Ferrari, but he would have to check with his wife first. So tomorrow we'll have a lot of sunshine, 41 in the morning, then a comfortable 66 in the afternoon. So maybe a light jacket or sweatshirt for the kids at the bus stop in the morning, but you'll be A-OK -okay later on in the day. We do it again on Wednesday, just a little bit cooler in the morning, around 33 degrees. Then Thursday and Friday, you'll notice humidity back in the air, some fog, maybe a few sprinkles, and possibly storms by Friday night. All right, thanks, Adam. Thanks mm -hmm. for watching the news at 6. World news is, well, not was already. <laughs> it's already. Sorry, I'm getting used to this. <laughs> the Bachelor's next. Yeah, right? There you go.